It said that if the combined income of all the 120,000 MIT alumni, living and dead, were put together, it would be the equivalent to the 10th largest economy in the world, which as of today is Canada at about $2.2 trillion. I did a video about Bell Labs a while back and how it created quite a lot of the key technologies that the modern world now runs and depends on. So I thought it would be good to look at another world leading institution, MIT or the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which has collaborated with Bell Labs on many occasions and also gave the world a whole host of technological breakthroughs. Going through all that MIT has been involved with would need a much, much longer video. So this will be a whistle stop tour to give you just an idea and a couple of examples. These include, but are not limited to, email, touchscreen technology, global positioning systems, magnetic core memory, voice recognition technology, robotics, inertial guidance systems, to name but a tiny few. And as of October 2023, 101 of their students and faculty professors have become Nobel Prize winners. But inventions and breakthrough technologies don't invent or discover themselves. And at the end of the day, it's the people who teach and the students of MIT who have created these and become those Nobel Prize winners. Probably the most famous person that most people will have heard of to have attended MIT is Buzz Aldrin, the second man to step foot on the moon with Apollo 11 in 1969. But he's just one of 38 astronaut MIT alumni. But it's when you go through the list of the more noticeable alumni, especially in the technology section, it becomes almost a who's who of some of the biggest and most influential businesses in the world. People like Robert Noyce, the co-founder of Intel, whose processors power most of the world's PCs and servers. Morris Chang, founder of TSMC, the largest chip maker in the world. Ivan Getting, co-inventor of the Global Positioning System, or GPS. Amar Bose, founder and chairman of the Bose Corporation. James McDonnell, founder of McDonnell Douglas. William R. Hewlett, co-founder of Hewlett-Packard, Cecil H. Green, co-founder of Texas Instruments, and Robert Metcalf, founder of 3Com and inventor of Ethernet, to name but a very few of the most successful graduates. Something that MIT has stuck to since its founder, William Barton Rogers, created the university in 1865, is that all MIT degrees are earned through academic achievement and that MIT has never awarded honorary degrees in any form. MIT benefited greatly from the war effort in the 1940s after Vannevar Bush, who was the vice president of MIT and the dean of the MIT School of Engineering, became the head of the US Office of Scientific Research and Development and authorized the equivalent of what is today billions of dollars of research grants for just a few select universities, including MIT, which was instrumental in the development of things like radar. One of the most famous Nobel Prize winners was Richard Feynman, known for his work in theoretical physics. He worked on the development of the atomic bomb with the Manhattan Project, and he's credited with pioneering the field of quantum computing and introducing the concept of nanotechnology some 20 years before it became a practical possibility. He also worked on the committee looking into the cause of a Challenger shuttle disaster and demonstrated how the O-rings in the solid rocket boosters had failed due to cold weather conditions, something that the NASA managers had chosen to overlook even when they were warned about it by the booster engineers themselves. He also was known as a keen popularizer of physics through his books and lectures. In a 1999 survey conducted by the British journal Physics World, which polled 130 eminent physicists, he was ranked as the seventh greatest physicist in history. As a child, Feynman was heavily influenced by his father, who encouraged him to ask questions and challenge orthodox thinking. And in the book, The Idea Factory, the author, Pepper White, was told by his first professor that it didn't matter what he'd learned at MIT but that MIT would teach him how to think. But as we've seen, you can be the smartest person on the planet, but it's what you do that defines you. And you don't have to have created a world-dominating business to have had a huge impact on the way people communicate 
And that's what Ray Tomlinson did. Tomlinson was an American computer programmer who entered MIT to continue his electrical engineering education and in 1965 developed a hybrid analog digital speech synthesizer as the subject for his thesis and his master's degree in electrical engineering. But that would be just a footnote in what he did later. In 1967, he joined BBN Technologies and worked on developing the 10X operating system for the PDP-10 mini computer. BBN Technologies were involved in a number of LISP-based artificial intelligence projects for DARPA, the US Military Defense and Research Agency. And these mini computers were connected together by the ARPANET system, basically a military precursor to the internet. Thomason wrote a file transfer program called CPYNet that would transfer files through the ARPANET. At the time, computers were very large and also very expensive, so many users would work on one computer on a time-shared basis, and messages could be sent from one user to another so long as they were on the same computer. Tomlinson was asked to change a messaging program called SendMessage to work on the 10x system, which he did, but he also made it so it could send a message to a different computer on the same network. Basically, he created the world's first email program. He did this by adding the at sign that separated the username from the computer name. And although it was his idea and not a directive of his employer, Tomlinson said later that he merely pursued it because it seemed like a neat idea. When Tomlinson was inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame in 2012, a comment on his work said the following. Tomlinson's email program brought about a complete revolution fundamentally changing the way people communicate. Tomlinson was also involved in the very first self-replicating program called Creeper, which was designed to move around the ARPANET, basically a computer worm or virus that we would know of today. Although it caused no damage, it would send a message to the teletype machine saying, I am the Creeper, catch me if you can. He made Creeper self-replicating rather than just moving from one computer to another. He also wrote the very first antivirus program called Reaper, which was designed to find and delete Creeper. Tomlinson was also credited with the invention of the TCP three-way handshake, which underlies HTTP and many other key internet protocols, all the things that no one ever thinks about, but is fundamental to our interconnected world of today. Tomlinson may well have created the world's first email and virus programs, but I doubt he could have foreseen how things might have progressed with the internet and how much it has become the underpinning for much of our way of life today and all the unintended consequences of being connected to the rest of the world. And this is where NordVPN comes in. NordVPN combines both threat protection features with a VPN service to hide your computer's real IP address and make it much more difficult for hackers to gain access to your computer, but also to stop trackers, block malware, and intrusive ads. NordVPN also encrypts everything you send over it, making it ideal for mobile apps when you don't know if an app is using the secure HTTPS protocol and can be used on up to six devices at once. If you find yourself being blocked from websites or services just because you're from another country, NordVPN can make you look like you're from almost anywhere so you can view sports channels, movie and TV that you might not have access to in your country. Act now and you can get Nord's two-year deal plus four extra months included by using the link nordvpn.com forward slash curious droid which is at the top of the description below and there's even a 30-day money-back guarantee so it's risk-free as well. Another behind-the-scenes MIT man was Jay Wright Forrester. Now he might not be that well known, but what he worked on affected the computers developed in the formative years of the 1960s and 70s. He co-invented magnetic core memory, and whilst this is no longer used now, it was key to the growth of computers, and it was used in the space shuttle up until the late 1980s. Much of this can be traced back to the Whirlwind computer, which was developed at the MIT Servo Mechanisms Laboratory for the US Navy from 1951. Whirlwind was the first computer to operate on real-time problems with continuously changing inputs and use random access memory and a light pen 
to write data to the screen of a video display. Although it was initially built for the US Navy, it will be taken over by the US Air Force and used to unify multiple data streams from radar systems, which transmitted the radar data over microwave links and telephone lines to the whirlwind computer at MIT to create an overall image of the airspace and track any intruders. The architecture of the whirlwind computer would go on to influence almost all business computers of the 1960s and 70s. One of the biggest bottlenecks was the memory which was available at the time, which was either mercury delay lines or electrostatic memory tubes, a form of vacuum tube. Both were slow, large, power hungry and unreliable. Forrester oversaw the project, but had also been looking at using magnetic cores, rings of hard magnetic material, usually semi-hard ferrite, which had wires pass through them. The value of the bit stored in the core is a zero or a one according to the direction of the core's magnetization, either clockwise or anticlockwise. Electrical pulses sent through the wires could then set or reset the bit and read the value it was set to. This was the first reliable form of random access memory that did not lose its data when it was switched off, similar to an SD card or memory stick, which we now use. Although others have been looking at using magnetic cores for computer memory, MIT computer engineer Jay Forrester received the principal patent for his invention. With increased miniaturization, by the end of the 1960s, memory density of about 32 kilobits per cubic foot was achieved using magnetic memory cores. Although we might look at this as being very primitive today, this tech bridged the gap between the valve and semiconductor era and also were very reliable. So much so that they were used in the Apollo guidance computer that was essential to NASA's successful moon landings and in the space shuttle. When the Challenger shuttle blew up on launch in January 1986 and the computers were recovered from the sea afterwards, the magnetic core memory was still functioning and could be read with the last data that was stored in it. This principle would be used for the architecture of semiconductor memory, which obviously we still use today. These are just a couple of examples of the thousands of ideas that have been developed by MIT and their alumni, not just in computer sectors, but across almost all of science, engineering, business, finance, biotech, and many others. And although there may be other institutions that claim to be bigger, MIT holds a unique position in the American psyche as the preeminent technical university, not only of the USA, but of the world. So thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please thumbs up, share and subscribe. And a big thanks go to all our patrons for their ongoing support.